Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Thomas O'Hara Small, the mayor of Culver City, and I want to welcome you all and thank you for coming tonight. As some of you know, we are thank you. As some of you know, we are celebrating our state of the city in a new way this evening, here in our gorgeous, newly restored Robert Frost Auditorium. Change is always challenging, but if we guide it carefully, it can be exhilarating. So I wanted to set exactly the right tone for the, for the evening, and I'm thrilled to have here with us tonight the renowned pianist Althea Waits. I want to make a special thanks to Jacaranda Music and artistic director Patrick Scott for making the arrangements for her performance tonight. Althea has had a relationship with the music of Duke Ellington her entire life, and her interpretation of this piece is sublime. The piece is called The Single Petal of a Rose, and it was composed by Duke Ellington for the Queen of England in 1958. Althea, please join us.
Thank, thank you so thank much, you. Thank you. Take these as well. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> Have a wonderful, let's go out this way. <laughs> And now for the presentation of the colors, we have Boy Scout Troop 108, Scout BSA Troop 15, and the Culver City Police and Fire Color Guard. Please stand. To lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, we have Lyra Brody Small. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Now I'm at the, at the hard part because I really can't see anyone out there. <laughs> but I have the pleasure of, of introducing and welcoming our, our, uh, my fellow elected officials and other dignitaries in the audience. Let me begin with President Herb Wesson. Let me welcome President Herb Wesson of the Los Angeles City Council. Very proud to have you here. Jacqueline Hamilton. Jacqueline Hamilton is here representing the Honorable Karen Bass, United States Representative, 37th Con Congressional District. Gloria Perlas Pulido, representing the Honorable Fiona Ma, California State Treasurer. <laughs> Sonia Lopez, representing the Honorable Holly J. Mitchell, State Senator, 30th Senate District. Cesar Montoya and Victoria Browder, representing the Honorable Sidney Comlogger Dove, Assemblymember, 54th Assembly District. The Honorable Jeffrey Prang, County Assessor, County of Los Angeles. Ibert Schultz, representing the Honorable Mark Ridley Thomas, 
Supervisor, 2nd District, County of Los Angeles. The Honorable Scott Houston, Director, West Basin Municipal Water District, Division 4. Welcome, Scott. And my colleagues on the City Council, the Honorable Megan Sally Wells, Vice Mayor, City of Culver City. The Honorable Joran Erickson, Council Member, City of Culver City. And the Honorable Daniel Lee, City of Culver City. And now our school board members with the Culver City Unified School District. I see we have President uh, Dr. Kelly Kent there. Do I, do I see our other school board members? Could they stand? I thought there were some here, but I'm not seeing them. Uh, our commissioners with the city of Culver City. I know I've seen some there in the front row, our Parks and Rec. Everybody, please stand, our commissioners. Thank you so much. John Knockbar, our city manager with the city of Culver City. Please stand. Leslie Lockhart, our, the superintendent of our Culver City Unified School District. And the, the folks that I work with every day, the department's head for, department heads for the city of Culver City. I know there's a bunch of them out there. If I could get them to stand. Chief White, I see in the front. Thank you all so much for being here. And, now, and my friend Christopher Hawthorne, the chief design officer with Office of Mayor Garcetti, City of Los Angeles. Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> Colin Diaz, the president and CEO of the... Culver City Chamber of Commerce, and the Chamber Board members. And I also see, I also see we have some former, a couple of former mayors at least. Could our former mayors please stand? Thank you so much. And then one, one, there are so many other dignitaries that, that I see often out there that it's just too many to name, but I am looking for my dear friend Janice Pober. There she is there. And I just want to si single out Janice because she has just retired from Sony Pictures, and she really is the model of, of how uh, an executive with a company like Sony uh, can, should comport themselves in the city of Culver City. She has had a partnership for 30 years or more with our school districts, with our art programs, and with our city. And I'm so honored to have you here with us tonight, Janice. Thank you for coming. OK. Now I would like to ask to join me on stage uh, Rabbi Zachary Shapiro and Reverend Carolyn Wilkins, who will offer us invocations for this evening. <laughs> Welcome and thank you. Good evening, everyone. Well, I know there's more out there than said good evening. <laughs> I'm a minister, so you know, we have to have call and response. So I'll try it again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, thank you. I know you're out there. And on behalf of the Culver City Area Interfaith Alliance and the Agape International Spiritual Center, I bring my greetings. Uh, I've lived here for many years, almost 20 years now, and I've had the opportunity to be with the mayors and the council. And what I want to share tonight is a message of opportunity, a message of inclusion, and a message of connectedness. One of the people that I have enjoyed from reading many 
sacred texts. I also read secular things. And a former poet laureate, Maya Angelou, said a few words that I enjoy. She said, it's not what you say that people will remember. It's not what you do that people will remember. But it's how you make people feel. That's what they'll remember about you. The reason I find that significant is because we're in a society, in a world of high tech, low touch. And the faith-based world is here. One of our greatest goals is to have us recognize, support, and honor each other. So when you walk into a faith-based community, if you don't leave knowing that they care, then you might need to find another location. But I want to begin in recognizing another phrase from Maya Angelou, and still I rise as I speak and greet you tonight. So as I speak this blessing on behalf of Culver City, Mayor Smalls, the council, I know that their intention, their vision, is for a city that is inclusive, a city that is prosperous, and a city that is welcoming. And still we rise to an occasion, to an opportunity, where we are looking not only at the prosperity of the companies that come in, but we look at the children, the welcoming of all races and ethnicities. We allow ourselves to be an inclusive community that understands that we have differences of faith, differences of economics, differences of backgrounds, but we can all still rise to the highest and know that the greatness that is within, that is endowed by the great divine can be exemplified in Culver City. So as I speak this word of welcome, speak this word of blessing, speak this word of prayer, I know each of you can bring forth the greatness in you so that you greet each other in a way that lets you others know that you care. That is the greatest blessing I can bring that we care for each other, about each other, and we help lift those who are in need and share the wealth. And it is in this word of the divine that I say, and so it is, amen, and from the African tradition, ashe. Thank you so very much, Reverend Carolyn. Shalom, everyone. Um, I'm Rabbi Zach Shapiro, Temple Akiba of Culver City. Months ago, following the horrific shooting in Pittsburgh, within minutes of that shooting in the synagogue, the Culver City Police Department was at our door because they cared. And that same day, that's at that same time, a couple of days later, the entire community of Culver City including all of those in the faith-based community, surrounded our congregation and entered our building with love and with peace. And that meant so much to us that we stand with this beloved, beloved community of Culver City. And at that time, I shared these words, which I'd like to share today because they're so true for what we stand for. We are Parkland, we are Newtown, we are Orlando, we are Las Vegas, 
We are Charlie Hedbo. We are Virginia Tech. We are Charleston. We are San Bernardino. We are Laramie. We are Oklahoma City. We are Columbine. We are Pittsburgh. We are Christ Church. We are all those places where violence and hate crimes have inflicted terror on humanity. But today, now, we are Culver City, and we bring a message to the world of shalom, of peace. We are Jews, we are Christians, we are Muslims. We are Hindus, we are Sikhs, we are Buddhists, we are Baha'i. We are atheists and agnostics. We pray to God, to Adonai, to Allah. We love our children. We are black, we are white, we are Latino, we are Asian, we are LGBTQ. We are Democrats, we are Republicans. We're immigrants and we're natives, we are survivors. We are. We are and we love and we dream and we hope. We are. We are Culver City. We pray and we listen. We embrace and we care. We are. We march toward truth. We replace darkness with light. We are. We pursue justice. We march for peace. We gather for unity. We inherit the rights to be safe in our schools, our houses of worship, and our places of recreation. But we also inherit the responsibility to demand more of our community when that safety is compromised. We are, and we will always be. As the prophet Amos taught us, let justice roll down as waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And as, a, as our liturgy in Judaism teaches, Baruch atah Adonai, haporei sukkat shalom aleinu va'al kol yoshvei tevel. Dear God, spread over us a loving embrace of your peace over us and over all the world. We are a men and a men. Thank you so much. Thank you. What an honor to have you both here. Thank you. Now we're about to see the premiere of a new short film that was just completed about Culver City. It's called Culver City Forward Motion. Uh, and I want to thank everyone who was, who was involved with this film, all of, all of the locations uh, that allowed us to, to film there. I, I want to thank the folks at uh, LBA Realty. I want to thank uh, Envoy, who let us do the interviews in their, in their studio. Uh, and and uh, David Sayeta of IDS, who let us film at, at the C3 building and everywhere else uh, around town. I think I, think, uh, I especially want to thank all of the cast who were interviewed in the film. Uh, they're named in your program, and I think many of you will recognize them all. So uh, please enjoy Culver City Forward Motion. Culver City is where the cities of the world will come to see their future. That future is incredibly bright, but also enormously challenging. 
I think most of the people who live here are really proud to be Culver City residents, and I think that in itself is really kind of a strong tie that binds everybody. I like to say to people, Culver City's human scale, you know? You get to know people, you get to know the people in the businesses, you get to know the people in the schools, in city government. That's one of the factors that makes us an oasis within the urban metropolis. We have access to our people. And I think part of what I like about Culver City is it's reinvented itself a few times. And Culver City is such a microcosm of opportunity. You can do things within the city boundaries that change and, and impact people's lives. It's a thing of beauty. I mean, you think it's, it couldn't possibly be real, but we're living it. All roads lead to Culver City. Historically, we attracted the preeminent film studios. Today, we are home to Apple, Sony, and Amazon. We host well-funded startups, NPR, and more great architects per capita than anywhere in the world. One of the things that's thriving in Southern California are those industries that are in the creative spheres. I often will tell people that I think Culver City is the cultural island of Southern California. And I think if you look at the galleries, the institutions that are here, it's really formed this sort of community of like minds and kindred spirits. The mix of businesses and amenities in Culver City I think really reflects the power of long-term planning. So the Culver City of the 90s had plans around really developing downtown and bringing in new types of companies. Now we have a lot of creative media here. And when and the powers that be get together and write a plan around how to do something, it tends to happen. We are about to embark with the city of Culver City on the update to your general plan. The general plan is a technical planning document, but really all it does is codify kind of what the city wants, what you see for the future vision, and help guide development. And not just physical development, but policies, environment, economy, what you want for housing, how you see your streets and parks. It's all of those things together. It's basically the future of your community. And we treasure our history. Even in the face of overwhelming change, we continue to maintain our traditional small town atmosphere. And I do think we're moving away from being really eager to take everything that comes our way and into a phase of being measured as we move forward. Our city remains socially, culturally, and economically diverse while our school district was recently named the fourth most diverse in the country. It truly is a microcosm of the world. I don't want to see that leave. So I think that if a value to the city, and it's definitely a value to the school district, we should do what we need to do to preserve that. You know, it's great that we have all these new companies coming into our city and I have the privilege of working on projects that they'll be going into. But I also think that it's important that it's a city for everybody and that we don't lose that ability to house and to be a city of diverse communities. One of the things that really affects us today, which we haven't really had to deal with before, is that we're running out of room. So the decision I suppose we have to make is how we're going to be able to house the number of people we have here, as well as employ enough people to have going companies so that we can pay the bills. We are a vibrant oasis at the heart of the LA metropolis. Downtown Culver is now a walkable urban haven. Our culinary scene is outstanding from fine wine and artisanal coffee to the best restaurants in the Southland. But we are a modest city, not teeming with the wealthy residents and vast resources of some of our neighbors. In our role as a chamber, we get the opportunity to kind of be the welcoming arm to the businesses. And one of the things that we're highlighting is we want them to be not just doing business in Culver City, but become part of the community and ingratiated with the local population and living in Culver City, having their kids go to school in Culver City, patronizing local Culver City businesses, getting involved in the, the numerous nonprofits that are here in Culver City. 
And I think as a whole, a lot of them intrinsically had that thought. So we do have a really long track record in Culver City of community partnership and that public-private partnership model. And we are re-upping on that commitment to really make it clear that we invite partnership and we also have expectations about what that should look like. Because we know that a lot of reasons why companies consider us are because of our thriving school district. We didn't have kids when we first moved here and over time we've really realized how important a good school district is to maintaining the property values and to maintaining the sense of place that we have here. Culver City gets it. They understand the connection between great schools and a great city. And we are extremely invested in, in the success of our schools because we're invested in the success for our children. Something like 25% of your public open space is actually streets. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could reclaim a little bit of that space for pedestrians, for the citizens themselves, to make it pleasant and walkable and feel like a really strong place that you want to be and not just a um, passage for cars. Transportation is both my personal interest but also one that the entire community is thinking about. What I think is a really big opportunity here is the voters of all of Los Angeles County made a big investment in Culver City by putting the Expo Line station here. And that is a massive opportunity that we've sort of started applying our big thinking to. There are opportunities to get us out of our cars and make quality of life better overall. I think with mobility and housing, if you hire local, not only do you have people that have a shorter commute, you have people that live in the community, and the likelihood of them uh, having a long tenure in the company is significantly higher as well. Well, I didn't later start realizing as a planner that if you build things correctly, they last. One of the really lovely things about Culver City is that we have a wonderful variety of parks. Walking, hiking, and jogging, um, enjoying open space, meditative therapy, escape, and I guess an egalitarian existence in a park. Um, color, creed doesn't matter. Religion doesn't matter when you come to a park. It just seems to me like the parks become the easy metaphorical bridge to bring people together of different backgrounds. We live in a world that is evolving and changing, and I think that it's a huge mistake to think that we need to go back to some safe, mythical past when everything was great for everyone, because that never existed. If a community kind of does what they've always done, it will be very difficult to keep up and maintain the quality of life and the character amidst all of these regional pressures. We're, we're in a funny place right now. We have to adapt to a different time. I think the next step is really serving the underserved, really looking to how we can help really bring in those people, those parts, those elements of the community that aren't benefiting. As we grow and evolve, we must engage in a discussion about change that includes all voices. We must generate the broadest possible public participation and give voice to those often excluded from the planning process. As long as they can manage the growth and allow for opportunity to, to continue to thrive um, and affordability. As long as they can do that, it's gonna remain that special place in my heart. We must have the wisdom, the tenacity, and the courage to move toward the future while preserving our heritage and our diversity. To move away from gridlock and decay toward prosperity, justice, and vitality toward resilience, well-being, and kindness. This film, uh, I believe it, it, uh, it expresses, it illustrates uh, the basis of really what I want to talk about tonight, which is 
which is how, which is a shared vision, a shared vision in our community, amongst our community for the future of our city. And I, I, think, I think it expresses that beautifully. And I, I just want to call out the, uh, the people who, who really helped, who really made this film. Our, our director and editor, Dan O'Brien, is out there. Our cinematographer, Patrick Giardino. And then our, our uh, secret treasure here in Culver City, who agreed with me when I, when I proposed that we raise the bar uh, on, the, on the movie that we're making, on, on the state of the city, and on just about every, everything else in the city, our city manager, John Nakbar. But this, this concept of a, of a shared vision, a plan, uh, is really, really what brought me to, to want to run for city council here in Culver City. The, uh, the story is that I, I, when I, I, my campaign was, was based on the concept of excellence in design, on what, what excellence in design uh, can bring to a city. I was, I was the architect's candidate. I was the urban planner, planner's candidate. I was the, the urban designer's candidate. Uh, and and it was, it was, I think it was a message that resonated, but when you get into a general election, of course, things get very simple. Uh, and what it, what, so the, the poster that ended up being most effective uh, was the one that made me the traffic guy. <laughs> the, the one that said, hate traffic, think small. And I think that's, that was part of what got me most of my votes. But the, the, so when I was elected, uh, we kind of had a, we ha I had a mandate to begin working directly on these issues. Uh, so one of the first things we did was we, we set about fashioning uh, an RFP, a request for proposals, to work on precisely that problem where it, at that time it was worst in our city, where in, the, in the transit-oriented district, uh, at the corner of Washington and National by our train station where the Ivy Station project is going up right now. And it was really driven by the residents of the Arts District because they, they could not get their kids to school in the morning. Uh, and that, the, the RFP was carefully written uh, by our excellent staff and, and really uh, cast a wide net and brought us uh, an excellent team of consultants uh, that was different, I think, for, than, than folks who most often work here in Southern California. We, had, we, had, uh, we wanted three things uh, from that project. We wanted, uh, we wanted a team that understood Culver City, that understood the geography, the mechanics, the topography of Culver City. We wanted innovation. We wanted uh, new ideas that were not going to be the same old, same old ideas that have not worked over decades here. And we wanted true... Uh, public engagement. That was probably the most important thing. So one of, one of our consultants had worked before here in Culver City, another was based here in Culver City, and then the mobility consultant was based in London. And so they, they brought a very different point of view. Uh, so that was, that was really a hugely successful project. I think it was one of the most successful uh, examples of good public outreach that I've witnessed. There was, there was great involvement in it. Every, everybody got involved. The, the neighborhoods woke up during that project. Uh, you know, the, the, it really, it focused on the, ended up focusing, the recommendations from it, ended up focusing on the Washington Boulevard corridor and recommending new things, uh, more bikes, transit lanes, micro transit, and, and actually the concept of slowing down the traffic on Washington Boulevard to discourage the cut through traffic. Uh, but the thing is that with these new ideas, whenever you try to do something new, you learn that change is hard and, and the real challenge becomes implementation, how to get there from here. But it, but it really, it, it, it inaugurated kind of a sea change, I think, in the culture of our city and we've become much more focused on this concept of mobility. It's something that we talk about all the time now. The, and it's something that we work with all the time. The Rancho Higuera neighborhood uh, really came alive. The, the uh, association in that neighborhood formed. 
uh, realizing that it was, you know, that this is the this was how they could we could work on this so that their kids could walk to school uh, without getting run over uh, across those streets that are constantly filled with traffic in the morning. Um, and the the at the same time that after you know at the end of that project, the Culver Studios was under was beginning to undergo its application for its renovation project that's underway now. And Rancho Higuera and the Culver Studios really teamed up and brought even more focus on the mobility uh, in that neighborhood. And the, the, uh, they helped us engage the RAND Corporation to focus on that neighborhood to create and to help, uh, help the city create an implementation plan which, which is going into effect over the next few months. So we're going to see new things. The results are, are coming. Uh, we formed, you know, our, our former parking and traffic com subcommittee became the mobility committee, uh, and this really, this is what, this trajectory kind of shaped the last few years for me. Uh, a focus on mobility and transit. I became the, I was elected to, the, to become the chair of the Sustainability Council at LA Metro, uh, which has given us access to partnership with Metro really at the highest level. And discussions, so we've already begun discussions about, about the possibility of congestion pricing, probably the, the kind of the hottest idea in, in the moment throughout the country about how to deal with these issues. You know, I, I, I was appointed to the Transportation uh, Committee at the Southern California Association of Governments uh, as part of this. The, so this focus on mobility uh, really, really is something that is, that is working hand in glove as we go forward with our general plan update, which, which I think is probably the most important thing that we will do here in Culver City uh, while, w during my tenure. The, the general plan is something that has been in, in the works for a long time. It was a big part of the reason why I, I chose to run for office, because it's just, it's hugely exciting to, to be involved directly in the, in the general plan process uh, in a city that is, a spe that is so special as this one, a city that is a, a microcosm of the world, that is a, a, uh, an oasis in the, in the metropolis, a city that is small enough so that we can actually get things done quickly, so that we can actually talk to each other. Um, now, a lot of, many of the things that we're dealing with are things that are beyond our control, are things that are, are issues that are regional, uh, traffic is certainly one of them where we need to work regionally. Um, but the, the growth and the development of cities is something that is happening all over the world. We, we over the last few years, uh, as, as, a, as a global society, we passed a landmark moment in that, in that uh, now more than 50% of the world's population lives in cities now. So all cities are growing. All cities are becoming more dense, and that number is growing. And this, this, that realization kind of fits in with one of the things that we realized during, during the, our, our transit-oriented district visioning process, which is that, that these issues, it's not, it's not about stopping development. That's something we're not going to be able to do. It's not about development. It's about mobility. It's about it's about options, about alternative modes of transportation, uh, and, and being ready for that change, being able to, ad to adapt and go forward, as our, our city historian, uh, Julie Lugo Serra, so eloquently pointed out. You know, the, the times of change, like, as, as that we are like the one we're in now, uh, are not unknown in history, and the, this, this aspect of, of our city at this time has always reminded me of, of a moment uh, in, the, in the wonderful novel from, from uh, Sicily about the 19th century in Italy, written by uh, Giuseppe di Tomasi Lampedusa. Um, it was actually written in our sister city of Capodorlando in Sicily, uh, you know, in, in the middle of the last century, and it tells the story of of the late 19th century in Sicily, when Italy was becoming a country for the first time, and when change, political, social, was just inevitable. It was, it was rolling over the country uh, in a way that overwhelmed everything. But one of the, one of the 
characters, the young characters, he, he says to the older one, to the prince, he says, Se vogliamo che tutto rimanga com'è, bisogna che tutto cambi. If we want everything to stay the same, everything must change. And that, that is simply a, uh, an, a beautiful way of, of saying that we need to be aware of this change, we need to manage it going forward. That if we don't, if we don't work with it, it will work with us. It will take over us. But over these, over these last couple of years, we've had some, some key projects here in Culver City. Uh, that have been part of this growth and part of moving forward, part of, of leading us toward that future. And one that many of us have been involved in and that, that I specifically chose as, as a project that I wanted to work on uh, in our strategic planning retreat uh, in my, my first year is the revitalization of Bayona Creek. Uh, the creek, Bayona Creek, uh, has been a concrete channel that we've looked on for many years and worried about it flooding. Uh, and it's, it's this hidden resource that in the future will be a linear park that will knit together our whole city with, the, with, the, with our regional partners to each side and, and, and carry us to the beach in, in ways that we have not imagined before. It's a, it's a hugely popular bikeway now, and as it becomes more green in the future, uh, it will be even more so. Uh, we had, so in, in, the, in my first year, uh, we won, working on that project, we, we won a grant for, for to, that, that supports two Civic Spark fellows who've worked on this project over the last two years. We've had four of these fellows now, engineers, urban planners, uh, landscape architects, uh, and we've had, we've had two major workshop meetings uh, with stakeholders from all over the county. Uh, focused on Bayona Creek and how Bayona Creek can be revitalized. But the, the, the most exciting thing that we're working on now in regard to the creek is a new type of financing called an environmental impact bond. And this bond is a private type of bond funded by private investors who want to see environmental and social impacts from their investment. Uh, and it's, it's, it's designed to fund projects exactly like this one. So the, the project that that's, the, that that's focused on, that the environmental impact bond that we're working on focuses on is to extend the bike path and the parkway of, of the creek into further up where it ends right now, further into Culver City, under Washington Boulevard, and then up into the city of Los Angeles, uh, in, into the district of my dear friend Herb Wesson, who is partnering with us on this. The, we're partnered with the city of Los Angeles, with the county of Los Angeles, and, and most explicitly with LA Metro because having this extended bikeway will connect uh, the, that whole part of the city of Los Angeles that is now underserved uh, to the metro so that you'll be able to get to the metro by foot, by bike, by wheelchair in a way that has never existed before. And, and it's, it's really created a, a, great, a, great, a great set of partnerships and great hope for for the, improving the quality of life in that area. One of the other areas that's seen, that's seen uh, you know, a, a lot of, of thought and discussion uh, over, the, over these past couple of years is the Fox Hills area. Um, and I have, I, I, I have recognized for, for a long time that the Fox Hills and the southern part of the city is in many ways the most exciting part of our city because the, the downtown area is, you know, has grown like crazy over the last decades, as we know, and it's become this walkable urban haven. Um, and the, the area that is really set to grow and change and to, to have great restaurants and to have better access is really, you know, Fox Hills and the Sepulveda Corridor uh, to the south part of the city. Um, there, there uh, you know, there's great opportunities there. The, the, uh, you know, the, there's a, the development that has been proposed there is, is, you know, in the process of, we're in the process of deciding and figuring out what that should be in, that, in, the, in the great piece of, of now available space there. And that project, over, over the last year or more, uh, two years even, has led to us uh, receiving a grant from the National Institute for Civil Discourse uh, that funded the Culver City Conversations, which were a pair of uh, extraordinary public meetings that we held in Fox Hills this past year. 
with a new type of technology that really gave voice to every, every single person in the room, every single person at the table. Uh, and that, that I think is really, was really a leap forward in helping us and helping that, that neighborhood begin to envision itself uh, and how the folks who live there want it to be in the future and, and how we can begin to, to head it even more in that direction, retaining what, what everyone loves so much about it, but also uh, having, it, having it grow into the future with all of the change that's surrounding us. The, the, other, the other fascinating project that, that, that has, has unrolled over the last couple of years is, the, is our City Hall Gardens. The, the landscaping around City Hall uh, is, is uh, set to become something completely different in the next, couple of, in the next few years. We, we approached it in a new way. We held a design competition uh, for, among firms, among landscape architects and architects uh, and other design firms, uh, we held this competition that was limited to Culver City firms. Uh, and the results, of, the results of the competition were just extraordinary. We had, we had uh, two, uh, our, amongst our finalists were two of the firms that were finalists for the Pershing Square competition in Los Angeles that was probably the best known competition uh, in landscape uh, in, in the country or maybe even the world over the last couple of years. So we had an extraordinary results. We, we, we chose uh, an excellent, uh, you know, world-renowned firm that was almost unknown here in Culver City, Y Architecture, uh, and, and that, that project is moving forward as we speak. Um, but the, these projects, uh, these projects and, and the, the other extraordinary uh, large projects that we have in Culver City, the Ivy Station, the Culver Steps, the Culver Studios that we all see uh, being, you know, growing before our eyes every day. Uh, these, were, these were the things that, that, uh, that I think encouraged the American Society of Civil Engineers to in, invite me to be the keynote speaker uh, at their conference, the International Conference of, on Sustainable Infrastructure uh, last year in New York City. Um, and these are, these are the things that I, these are some of the things that I spoke about uh, when I was invited to speak to the board of National Public Radio uh, a few months ago uh, when I was invited to welcome them and speak to them at their, at their board retreat that was held here at NPR West here in Culver City. But all of this, all of this, uh, this growth, this change, this development that we have here, it's, it's spurred by... Uh, the, the, you know, the extraordinary technological you know, revolution that we've been seeing over the last years uh, by, by Silicon Beach that, that is uh, really uh, on the beachhead here in Culver City now. This is, this is something that's been, that, that is not new. It's been happening in, in Seattle, in the Bay Area, who are, who are somewhat ahead of us right now in, in this. Um, but it's been the economic engine that has really fueled our entire country and, and changed the world really over the last, over the last decades. Um, but having these companies, these firms here in Culver City, the Amazon, Apple, uh, you know, Sony has been the model for us, is, is what's, what's taught us how we can move forward with these companies. But the, having these companies here, it really is demanding a new kind, a new type of public-private partnership. It's something, public-private partnership, we need to raise the bar on how we have done this in the past, and we need to enter into a new era of closer relations with these companies. We need, I think that they are realizing it too, with what's happened in San Francisco, what's happening now in Seattle. You know, in, in San Francisco, the, the displacement has been tremendous. It's a city of the very rich, and the very poor now. The, the middle class has almost gone there. But we're lucky here in Culver City in that we can see what's happened in the recent past and we can, and we can work with that going forward. We can do better. And this is, this is, this is the challenge for us. To, to enter, and it's just beginning, to enter into uh, these kinds of partnerships with these firms that will be, that will be working here 
that will be bringing 3,000 new employees to our downtown over the next few years. It's, it's a challenge and it's an incredible opportunity. You know, in, in, this, in this very special situation going into our general plan, I've, I've, I've come to understand that, that process in a new way. Uh, the, we, worked on, we worked on the request for proposals for our general plan over, over a number, if not many months. And in, in many ways, it was influenced by our earlier experience with the TOD visioning process, but it was even deeper and more thorough. And, and uh, led by our, our community development department uh, and, and our excellent director of, of, of development, uh, Saul Blumenfeld. The, and the RFP for that, for that project, uh, we put so much effort into it that it actually became kind of a famous RFP. It was, it was, we attracted firms from around the country, from as far away as Copenhagen and, and Vancouver. Uh, and the, the, so it's, it's had a tremendous amount of work that's gone into it already, even, even though the process itself uh, is about, is, is soon to kick off. We've chosen our consultants. I think we have, we have an extraordinary team there. Um, and working on it, I've, I've come to see it in a different way. The, it is a, it is a, as was described in the film, it's a technical document and it's governed by uh, state law. And it has, it has a, a prescripted number of elements that we look at from land use to housing to mobility. But I've, I've come to realize that perhaps that the heart of it uh, is really about a different thing. And it's really about, it's really, and this is where the opportunity for us really is. This is where the opportunity is to, to, to have our community, to have our city move into the future in, in a, in a way that, that has not existed in the past. The question is, can we have this growth, this growth that's fueled by this incredible technological economic engine, can we have growth that is inclusive? Can we have growth that does not fuel displacement? Can we have this growth, can we have this prosperity, and yet still have a community that remains diverse, that respects its history, that, that has housing, for every level of, of economic ability. That, that is the key. That, and this is, this is something that, that really has not existed in the past. We, we, we look back on the past uh, as, as uh, something that's halcyon, where things were more comfortable for us, but they were only more comfortable for some of us. You know, if you, if you, you know, this past, this past week, we had, we had an oil spill in our community. You know, the, the oil fields, you know, that are right at our doorstep, that are right in the heart of our community, they have been regulated in a sense, but not regulated in a way that benefits everyone. And this is something that has to change. The, you know, in the past, for a glimpse into it, into that past, there is, to that aspect of our past, there's, a one, there's an extraordinary article that's just been published called The Hidden History of Culver City Racism that was written by John Kent. Um, and I, I highly recommend it to everyone. Uh, I, think, I think it shows us a way into the future as well. Thank you. Please do applaud. That's a perfect moment. But that question, can't ha you know, can we and how can we have growth that is inclusive? Is the challenge for us in our general plan, it's the challenge for us in our, in our city moving forward. Now, one, one, how do you do this? One of the, one of the answers uh, that I encountered again just this past week was an extraordinary extraordinary firm, a company that's based here in Culver City, in fact in Fox Hills, that I had never known about before, that, that really offers a different model of business than I've ever seen before. And I, and I wonder if there's any, any of my friends in the audience from Audicon. I, I hope they're here tonight. Anybody out there from Audicon? Can you wave, please? 
Oh, there they are in the, there they are in the back there. Thank you so much for coming. But Otacon, visiting Otacon was, was a revelation to me. Otacon is a, a, a high-tech company that is not very old. It's, you know, it's, it recently merged with a German firm that, does the, that is in the same business. And they are consultants in information technology, uh, consultants in, in they, they code, they work with other IT firms, uh, and all of the employees uh, at Otacon are on the autistic spectrum. And the extraordinary thing is that they have, that they, each of them, each of the folks that works there has an extraordinary talent that surpasses what anyone else could do in what they do. They, you know, it's my understanding that they, that, you know, I saw a room full of young people in front of, you know, in front of computers, eating pizza with me, offering me sandwiches, um, at, you know, celebrating the, the day of autism. We're going to have a proclamation for them for the month of autism later this month. Uh, and they, that is the company's mission, is to work, is to employ uh, individuals who are on, on the autistic spectrum doing something that they can do that is better than, than anyone else could do in that same job. And that is the kind of innovation, that is the kind of creativity in business that will help lead us into the future. So it was, I, was, I, was thrilled, I was thrilled to get to see how they work. I'm, I'm thrilled to get to describe them to you here tonight. They, they offer, they offer that, that kind of company offers the, the, the type of, offers the kind of creativity that we need going forward. The, the point, the moment that we're at um, in our city uh, and, in, in, and in our society, it, it often makes me think of, of an image um, from a, a beautiful book uh, by a scholar and philosopher named E.R. Dodds, a book called The Greeks and the Irrational that I first read many years ago. But the, in, in The Greeks and the Irrational, E.R. Dodds, uh, is describing the, the ancient Greek culture, ancient Greek civilization, and, and how, it, how it rose and then and how it fell. Because the, the, the Greeks depended on rationality. That was, that was they, they were a more rational uh, civilization than existed before. And it, and it created you know, something that was, that was extraordinary in history, but it was not something that could last. It was not something that was sustainable through, through uh, what they faced. You know, they faced challenges as, as our society does. Uh, and in the end, they failed. And the image that Dodds offers is he, he imagines Greek society, Greek civilization, riding on a horse, on a horse that has to leap a chasm, the chasm uh, of the challenges that it faced. And he, he realized that the horse, that the horse of rationality that the Greeks had was not strong enough to leap that chasm. And Dodds, Dodds hopes that modern, that modern society can have a horse that would be strong enough to leap over that chasm. So that, that, is, that image is my hope for us here in Culver City, my hope for us here in the United States, my hope for our society really worldwide. Because the chasm that we have to leap is can we create, can we engender uh, growth in a society that is truly inclusive, that truly includes everyone. So I believe, I believe that's where we have to go. And, and, uh, and it's all of us in this room that can make that happen here in Culver City. So thanks, thanks so much for, for joining us, joining me here tonight. <laughs> now for the fun part of the evening, I'd, I'd like to ask, Joanna Lee Brody to join me on stage. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello. Hi. So um, I am here tonight to present the Citizen of the Year Award, which was started two years ago by former Mayor Jim Clark to honor someone in our city who has contributed in extraordinary ways. And as you all might imagine, it is exceptionally hard to choose one person. Um, you all know the good people of Culver City, collectively as a community of a, as a whole, you're all sitting out here, it could be any one of you. Collectively as a community, um, we have put in thousands and thousands of hours towards making Culver City a better place to be. And I believe if we added up all the time and energy that the people who live, learn, work, and play here put back into Culver City, that we could go to the Milky Way and back, probably two or three times. School beautifications, creek cleanups, donating food to events, stuffing food into backpacks for kids in need, hosting international visitors from our sister cities, pouring beer in the beer garden during Fiesta La Bayona, coaching Little League, YMCA basketball, and AYSO soccer, hopefully before the beer is consumed, not after, volunteering on chamber boards, city commissions, PTAs and councils, and school boards. Sometimes it's for one hour, sometimes it's for eight years, and sometimes it's for a lifetime. This year, we decided to honor not one, but two people. Because each as individuals, they're pretty darn great. But as a couple, they are models of generosity, thoughtfulness, hard work, and most of all, humility. Sophisticated thinkers, world travelers, entrepreneurs, musicians and artists, yet so down to earth that they are the easiest people in the world to hang out with on a street corner and shoot the breeze. And our family is lucky enough to live on the same corner as these two wonderful Culver citizens. Please give, me, give a round of applause for Diana and David Hauptman. Well, wait, wait, not yet. Well. So, I have more to say. <laughs> I have more to say about the Houtmans. Do you want to come up now? And yeah, this is the live part of the show that we didn't get to rehearse. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. So when we moved into Culver City, um, when we moved into our home, David and Diana were some of the first people that we met on our block. <laughs> and we patted ourselves on the back for moving in across the street from the mayor. Little did we know what was in our future. And it was David who first planted the seed in Thomas's head to run for council, but I'm not sure I should thank you for that, David. <laughs> now this award is not supposed to go to elected officials, but the Houtmans are so much more than the years that David served on council. They opened their business 40 years ago at the corner of Washington and Ince, where the Toyota dealership now stands. Originally a machine shop, after the Cold War ended, they needed to reinvent, and Foldagol was born. Their family-owned business provides portable soccer equipment nationwide to lots and lots and lots of soccer players all over the country. Speaking of soccer, David and AYSO Region 19 are practically synonymous. He's been a volunteer since his kids played soccer 40 plus years ago, and eventually became a commissioner. He's still involved and still one of the biggest cheerleaders for AYSO soccer. Diana started out volunteering in the schools and parlayed that into a stint on the Culver City Education Foundation board, a cause that is still near and dear to her heart. Both David and Diana have been honored by CCEF, David as a, 
uh, Volunteer of the Year and Diana as a CCF Shining Star. Both have been very active in our Sister City program, acting as Culver City ambassadors abroad and hosting foreign visitors in their home. They're longtime members and supporters of Temple Akiba, which has also honored them. And Diana still sings in the Temple Akiba Choir. Diana also was an integral part of the city's recent 100th birthday celebration as a volunteer on the Centennial Committee. And in addition, Diana has been a board member of Sandy Siegel Health Center for 30 years. And she says she's not quitting. But it's not just the big stuff. They also do the little stuff. The little stuff that rarely gets attention. Organize annual block parties and holiday sing-alongs fix the kiln at the school, serve on the neighborhood council, and act as crossing guards during Halloween so all of the young trick-or-treaters can safely cross the streets. So please help me give a warm and big thank you to our neighbors and our friends and your Culver City Citizens of the Year, David and Diana Houtman. You, she's got some cards with words on them. I have a, just a little short uh, something that I wanted to say. Um, we moved to Culver City 50 years ago. And the reason why we moved here was because some very, um, I would say, kind lady decided to, uh, or allowed us to, to rent her house, uh, especially rent, uh, rent her house to an interracial couple. And at that time, it was quite a, quite a deal. Um, we were only going to stay for two years. And uh, here we are. <laughs> I, I remember reading someplace where uh, there was a sign somewhere, and it said, bloom where you are, are uh, planted. And so this resonated, I told David, and it, this resonated with us. David and I jumped in from uh, Mrs. Greenspan's Mommy and Me class, the Historical Society, the Art Association, Temple Akiba. We just immersed ourselves in this great city, and we are so happy to call this our home. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thank you so much, David and Diana. Well, before, before we bring on the Angel City Chorale for our finale tonight, uh, you know, I, I, I knew we were going to have a, a few missteps and glitches doing something new and kind of un understaffed for uh, an event like this tonight. Uh, but there are, there are a, uh, I, think, I think, three people who really made this happen who were hidden behind here that I really want to thank. Uh, and that's Shelley Wolfberg. Uh, <laughs> Elaine Garrity Warner and Heather Moses, because they were the ones that really made this happen. So please welcome the Angel City Chorale.
And I know, I, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but uh, please, we're, we're going to be at the Culver Hotel afterwards, so please join us. Join us for a drink if you have time. 